started. Okay, the recording has uh, started. All right, hello and welcome to the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee meeting. Everybody is welcome to participate in our open source community and this call, as long as you abide by our antitrust policy and our community code of conduct. You should check both those out in detail, but in short, the latter is be polite. All right, we have a lot of things to discuss today, or at least we've got some discussions that I anticipate might take a while, uh, including our ongoing discussion about expansion and convergence. Uh, so what I'm going to try to usher us through the, well, I'm going to try to usher us through the first several topics here uh, with the hopes of leaving as much time as possible for that discussion. But we do want to make sure that we've got uh, everything covered, so feel free to speak up if we're moving too quickly. Uh, first up for the announcements, the election is underway. If you have contributed this year, which is something like a commit or participating uh, towards a uh, work product in a working group, you should have gotten a uh, form in email or you should have subscribed to the contributors list and you can see all that at the uh, link in the agenda if you are missing something. Uh, last week uh, we heard about the new meeting to get the marketing team and the contributors together to make sure that the projects are being conveyed in a way that the, the contributors to those projects are happy with or vice versa, that they can help the marketing committee better promote those projects. So make sure that you're taking advantage of that meeting. The link is there for that as well. And then we've got a boot camp coming up in Russia. I guess I could have put these things in a slightly different order. We've got the maintainer summit first in Minneapolis, followed by the boot camp in Moscow the following week and links are up for both of those. Uh, last week, we also took ownership from, uh, each of the, the TSC members took some ownership to go reach out to different maintainer communities to make sure that they're all recruited to participate. We saw some threads for some of those, so thanks for following up on those. Uh, we are looking for more input on the agenda for that summit in particular, and you can feel free to add that directly to the uh, to the page for the maintainer summit <clears throat> and then the the last announcement is kind of a pre-announcement that the diversity civility and inclusion working group has started designing the community survey uh, we want to use that to baseline the diversity and civility and inclusion status of the community but uh, also looking at maybe getting the developer survey questions that we'd done previous years integrated with that. Uh, so looking for some initial feedback on that and we'll bring um, something for review probably uh, in, a, in a week or two. Uh, it's sort of just started at this point. All right, do we have, looks like we've got the rest of, yeah. Okay, got everybody else here, so great. Just in time for the voting topics. So uh, Composer, uh, maybe about a year ago, started signaling that they wanted to wind up new feature development. And they've formalized that now in a note that you should have uh, seen on the TSC list, looking to move the project formally to deprecated status. Uh, in the policy that we ratified recently, projects, uh, their maintainers can request to move to deprecated status. And the intent is that after six months, then the project would be end of life and archived. In the note to the TSC, uh, Simon noted that they might want to continue to merge fixes beyond the six months, and I see no issue with that. Uh, so uh, open it up to some brief discussion here. If anybody has any uh, objections to allowing Composer to move to deprecated status. So my, I guess it's a clarification. To me, end of life means we're not doing anything with it. I'm fine with it going to deprecated status, but if they're still going to fix certain, uh, you know, issues that, that are found, then it's not really end of life, right? Right. Or is it? Distinct stages. The first is deprecated where 
the intent is that the maintainers are trying to fix at least emergency issues uh, and the community can be moving off to other tools. And then the second is end of life to where uh, there won't be any more changes to that project. So is it correct to say that the plan is to deprecate it and then wind down towards end of life in six months, but with Simon's note that they might take longer than six months, meaning they might fix things longer than just that six month window? Right. Is Simon on himself or Caroline or Dan? All right. Uh, I don't see them on, but yes, that's that's what I read from the email that they want to move immediately to deprecated status, which is effectively what they've been in for a while now. But they want to keep Composer in deprecated status for about six months, but uh, they just want to keep that end date loose. So if they need to merge an emergency patch, uh, they can still do that. Any issues so, with that? Well, I'm fine with it going I just if, if we declare it end of life then we shouldn't do more to support it at all I think by definition so is end of life a separate voted on step as well yes versus okay so then yeah no I'm fine with this okay um, I think we said that we had to take a vote does that sound right Arno yes I think that would be good all right, so let's do uh, just a voice vote then. Uh, who's taking minutes this week, by the way? It's like Dave's on. Yeah, I'm here. Um, are we doing this uh, roll call vote? No, we'll just we'll just do a voice vote. I just wanted to make sure that. Uh, uh, yep. I yeah. We're bringing, this is being recorded. Yeah, and Rye's here, so yeah. he should be recording it. Um, so the votes will be captured and reflected in the minutes. Excellent. All right, so all in favor of allowing Composer to move to deprecated status? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, that passes. Okay, on to the Gardener proposal. And uh, where we left off with Gardner uh, sort of dovetails into the subject that will follow this, which is the TCF proposal. And there is some observation of some functional overlap there with Gardner being an oracle and uh, TCF having an aspect that is um, potentially like an oracle. And there was a request that those two communities talk and come up with a plan. So my understanding of that plan is that um, Gardner would like uh, to create a lab for the Gardner code base and then also simultaneously to join the TCF community and work towards integrating components that come out of the Gardner code base and uh, otherwise working to improve and create the TCF code base. Is there anybody from the Gardner proposers on and, and or TCF that can uh, say if I've got that correct? Uh, it's Eugene Yarmash from TCF, I think so, but I think there is somebody from uh, Gardner as well. Yeah, this is Ekin here. Um, I'm from Gardner and yeah, yeah, this is the what we agreed on during this week with, um, with TCF. That's wonderful. Well, I'd be happy to sponsor that lab if you still need a sponsor. Um, and the process for creating a lab is posted up on the, the GitHub site there for the labs. But we can also direct you to that on chat or the mail list as well. All right, that sounds good. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll take a look at the, the GitHub and how to get that lab started. It would be nice to, um, you know, have maybe <laughs> some sort of introduction to the process like one on one as well or like somehow like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we can set up time to do that outside of this meeting. Well, I think that's uh, great that, that both of your communities were able to get together so quickly and, and show some quick collaboration. Yeah, it's uh, very excited. We're, um, we're very happy um, in, that the Gardner team to work together. And um, yeah, we're excited about TCF and, and the value that we can create together. All right, thanks. All right, Thank without you. further ado then, we can move on to the TCF proposal. 
so Eugene, would you like to take us through a, a summary of the proposal? I think most or all of the TSC has uh, reviewed that over the, the couple weeks that it's been up there. Sure. So um, pr proposal obviously is online and the idea here that we trying to address the scalability and privacy issues using the different trusted uh, compute options uh, starting from the uh, Intel HGX and then adding additional components. What is uh, we're trying to do, we're also trying to make sure that we use these trusted compute options to offload execution from the blockchain. And the most specific examples would be the, for example, genomics that can run days, or it can be IoT streams that can produce the volume of the data that um, uh, to uh, the too many to process on the uh, normal blockchain, and that is type of usages that we really care about. We also want to present preserve the computational trust, and we believe the trusted compute options, and including zk, MPC, and the TE environments, provide a good way to extend computational trust to this type of uh, use cases. And the um, finally, we're trying to be uh, to drive adoption of the standard-based implementations because we believe that this is one of the major obstacles for adopting the uh, DLT technologies um, in enterprise world. So we're starting by implementing the specification. It's called uh, off-chain trusted compute specification developed using the um, enterprise. Um, inter um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and uh, within the Trusted Compute Work Group. So that is pretty much kind of like the high level summary. And we do have a pretty um, good community that already uh, interesting in the um, this project. I think we have total 13 uh, sponsors. Uh, and practically all of them committed real resources to work on particular areas of interest. And the good news that they focus on different areas so we can build up community, make it productive, I believe, um, pretty quickly. So that pretty much all I have for now. And feel free to ask questions. Okay, thanks for that, Eugene. Uh, one thing that sticks out to me is that I think this project has the largest sponsorship of any that we've seen so far uh, if not the largest certainly close to the top so i think that speaks a lot for it eugene can you talk a little bit about um what the sponsorship commitments are to the project so um we have a number of different uh, commitments so some companies has been involved in these work already uh, that, um, for example, like iExec, the the initial code base that has been committed to Hyperledger Lab, has actually came from three sources. It came from the initially from the PDO project, uh, private data object. It came from the then it was taken private, and um, the Intel made the necessary uh, adjustments and modification to turn this into. TCF, we also during this stage had the uh, iExec as a contributor. So iExec current level of contribution primarily focused on what we call a proxy model integration for the Ethereum. And uh, the, they also working on the use case within the um, heavily promoted within EA called Trusting Tokens. The chain link is a company known for Town Crier is going to work on the attested oracles. The um, the gardener that we mentioned uh, uh, the, during the um, previous topic that is actually they're going to work on some debugging tools. Uh, we have um, IBM as a contributor who is interested to integrate in TCF with Fabric. Uh, Intel obviously going to work on the core components. We have an interest from Alibaba. They want to provide the GoLang environment. Baidu also wants to integrate their MESA TE environments. We have a BGI, the company from China working on genomics, and they want to continue on that and also contribute to Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, uh, we have the um, 
contribution from consensus, but this is mostly on the architectural side because they very active in the EA. Um, we have uh, Collider. Collider is a company that provides manageability solutions and they're going to work to provide manageability solution for hosting trusted compute service and cloud services. We have Microsoft that provided the um, uh, Azure um, resources for the hosting T uh, testnet and we're also in discussion with them on the some number of other topics there for integration, for example, for EEA. We have a Santander, which is the bank federation that um, <clears throat> going to work on a number of finance related use cases and finally we have wipro uh, who is going to contribute to developing new form of the uh, <coughs> war uh, trusted compute options like Z zk and mpc okay that was quite a mouthful um nate did you want to pop your question out here to the to the group yeah, maybe it's best to let John take the lead on this question, but um, as we've been diving through this project proposal, it's really clear that it seems to have pretty broad-based support, especially from the traditional smart contract approach. Um, for those of us who are kind of sitting a little bit outside of that smart contract approach, I'm having a little bit more trouble understanding how it overlaps with both the Transact project as well as with URSA um, relative to both the, the aims around multi-party computation and zero-knowledge proofs, but also around um, uh, how low level is the the component and how reusable it might be relative to to what we're doing with verifiable credentials and other mechanisms for creating attestations so I can take just a piece of that anyway the um, so TCF sets up uh, a lot of potential off-chain uh, workers and it accounts for uh, zero knowledge mechanisms, but probably not yet in real specific detail. So I think one of the ways that that I foresee interacting with this project and URSA is trying to take what we're working on in URSA and make sure that that can be leveraged in TCF and supply any requirements that that we can provide to make sure that that can be described through the the TCF interfaces. So if, if TCF is an interface-based system, what does that mean relative to Hyperledger Transact? So that is a little bit a different approach as I understand. So we are looking into this area and my understanding that Transact is mostly focused on the um, executing the uh, smart contracts on chain and they may or may be a trusted compute options or they just can be a regular environments. While the um, trusted compute framework focuses specifically on the, only on the trusted compute execution options and executing these uh, um, smart contracts or workloads, we call them, the uh, off-chain. So that is, I think, that is where the difference. How to converge them we would have to look more closely. And that maybe another way of thinking of it is that Transact is about the sort of what you're executing and TCF is more focused, at least in this incarnation, about where. Where do you get the resources to do the execution? So, yeah. so Nick, what would, <laughs> what would you, how would you describe any convergence that might happen there? Uh, you might very well have a way of running an instance of Transact inside um, one of these trusted execution environments that are allocated. So if you think of the, the TEE, what, what you are running inside the trusted execution environment that you're receiving um, is independent of the specification of TCF. So you could put a Transact instance inside there if you wanted to. I, and, and I'm saying that in the most absolutely general terms possible because I have no idea how to make that happen. But, <laughs> but you might imagine that or you might imagine um, taking a WASM or EVM and running it inside there as well. Um, so it's, it's less about, so TCF is less about what runs and more about um, how to allocate the resources and get the results back in a trustworthy way. 
Yeah, and I guess my concern here is as we get into a practical implementation that they'll both solve the easiest parts of the problem and they'll, be, they'll turn out to be the same parts of the problem. Um, but if we're kind of visualizing that there's overlap either in the personnel or in the approach in the sense that they're at least theoretically something that can come together, I don't think I have much of a problem with that. Um, I don't see any theoretical problem. I see a lot of, a lot of engineering issues um, in order to make it work. Um, and, and I will say from our side, you know, the work that we're doing in, on the PDO is really the research that's feeding ideas into things like TCF. And so, you know, trying to come up with, for example, a WASM contract interpreter that could run inside an enclave that could be, you know, a stepping stone towards a more general execution environment. I mean, those are the kind of things that we're worried about. Yeah, so how I think of them uh, at a high level is Transact is a library that facilitates integration for contract interpreters. And TCF is, in a way, a set of contracts that facilitates discovery and dispatch of workloads to off-chain stuff. And that off-chain stuff is where maybe there's another potential integration point that really Mick was talking more about, that if you're going to treat that off-chain execution environment as a smart contract interpreter, then maybe you would leverage the transact library in how you construct that. But I see them as occupying pr principally different areas. I think so, the, the other end of the ahead. integration, sorry, um, for this as well is, uh, and the bit that interests me about uh, TCF and Gardner is scheduling your off-chain computation um, from a smart contract. So uh, requesting some work to be done and, and for that to happen. I think the other perhaps dividing line maybe to draw there is that this is a, a kind of, this is an asynchronous model. You, you wait to get the results back, um, whereas transact is synchronous. So just a question, because I'm not a big security guy, but is this reliant on SGX or is it one option? It's a one option. Okay, so, because it, SGX hasn't been accepted by the upstream kernel, right? By what? It, it's, has it been accepted by the up in the upstream Linux yet? Yeah, there are definitely Linux drivers for it. There's Linux drivers for it, but it's not upstream. Intel offers drivers, right? Uh, yeah, not not to go too far down there. I yeah, I was gonna say I don't know that that's a. I I hear what you're saying. It, um, the installation process and the management processes are pretty straightforward. So. Okay. But yeah, TCF is a spec in. The, yeah. It talks about how you could do off-chain trusted execution, either through a trusted execution environment or through MVC or NISIC. So, yeah. So, a and, lot of options. Yeah. So, Mark, just to, to remind you that one of the contributors, one of the sponsors is specifically focused on adding the zero knowledge pieces of this as well. Um, and there are other TEEs beyond SGX that would be potential places where you could hardware-based TEs where you could do this kind of execution as well. Do we the have spec is actually pretty general. So. Do we have any contributors or maintainers looking to support anything other than SGX? Uh, um, I think Eugene mentioned one of the companies is is actually focused on doing the zero knowledge group. Yeah, uh, the portions of it. I, yeah. I, and it's still very early. Clearly, the first implementation will be from the SGX side of things, but that is also clearly not where we want to stop. Okay, thank you. So I had a question so I, on I the... Think I feel, sort of... I feel, uh... Sorry, I, I have another question to just follow up with that thread. So, <laughs> Uh, I, I think it's still very early to talk about, you know, the release of, of this framework someday. But what would you envision the release of this framework would contain? Uh, would that be SGX in addition to zero knowledge or in addition to uh, other 
trusted framework implementation, or you would come out, or would it be okay for you to come out with only one uh, solution provider? Uh, no, the one solution provider probably won't work because even the specification in its current state uh, calls out for these three um, uh, different types of transaction options. We expect that to continue to grow. And one of the key objectives for the release of the TCF would be to make sure that we support all of them or at least most of them. So that is the criteria for the release. Uh, well let's call that product release of the TCF. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, and for uh, my, um, my, my question, yeah, thank you. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit what was discussed earlier, but I'm wondering, uh, let's imagine we have a network with lots of participants, because that's what we want to have on networks, and you've got um, one participant who has chosen to do their trust with, um, offload in um, SGX, and you've got another participant who's decided to do it with zero knowledge, um, and those participants want to do business together or transact or operate on the chain in such a way that they both end up executing their contracts, so they, they uh, move something between them or, uh, or whatever. So they have to trust the operation of the entire chain and both of those contracts in full operation. What's the plan for how person A or party A would validate the attestation and the quality and the security of the TE chosen by party B and vice versa. Is there ever any suggestion or intention that all system participants should be able to deep quote all, as all trusted aspects of the system? Because uh, the diagram on the wiki only really goes as far as the contract owner trusting the offload of a bit of their contract to their chosen enclave technology, but of course not everybody trusts the same stuff. So what's, what's the thought about mixing and matching here? So uh, the, um, it's a very dry document, but there is uh, EA specification. And from that EA specification, uh, the summary would be that uh, the specification itself treats all uh, um, trusted computer options identical and treats them as a black box. As long as party A and party B agree that two different uh, trusted compute options equally suitable for them, they can execute their um, workloads in those options. Obviously, the workload is going to be different. So how are they going to know that? There is going to be published information, attestation reports about the each of the workers so they can know that they can trust those workers. And once they execute it, there is a mechanism how they, uh, it's called receipts, how these receipts recorded on the um, blockchain and the both parties can acknowledge they agree with the results. So fundamentally, the, uh, yes, the assumption that they have to be mixed and matched freely for the execution. Obviously, uh, since we don't have real implementation for multiple options yet, we will have to finalize the details of the specifications and obviously the implementation to make this real. But that is definitely the intent to mix and match them as needed. And, and just to be clear on that, Eugene, uh, what you're saying is that the trust relationships are really punted to the parties that are trying to agree with one another rather than being formalized in the specification, right? That's correct. So specification is kind of dry specification and it leaves significant room for the interpretation and uh, so the application specific implementations. So obviously we cannot define everything in this spec. Okay, um, I think that runs the course of the questions that we've seen so far. Um, in the interest of time and getting to our expansion and convergence, like to move that we take a vote on the TCF proposal. Somebody like to second that? Second. All right, let's go ahead and do a roll, vo roll vote as this is a project proposal. Do we typically do roll votes for project proposals? That's my I'm, recollection. I'm I'm getting to the uh, I'm getting to the list.
the list is at the end of the page. Uh, otherwise, you can just click on the technical steering committee on the left and you'll have the list of people. So Brian is pointing out something good that we should probably approve condition on a new name from the marketing committee or a new name in general. Yeah, so I think what we decided in yes. the past is that we don't approve names. That, uh, that'll be worked out between the marketing committee and the, um, and the project proposers. Okay, um, Arno. Yes. Bow Wow. Yes. Ben. Yes. Chris. Chris. Yeah. Dan. Yes. Hart. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Mark. Yes. Mick. Yes. Nathan. Yes. Silas. Yeah. Motion passes. All right, congrats to the uh, TCF team. Excellent, thank you guys. All right, now on to the uh, main event in some sense, uh, expansion versus convergence. We've had pieces of the discussion uh, over the last year and the opportunity to bring in Bezu has sort of crystallized some of the uh, possible outcomes of of those two options. Uh, I'd linked in here some of the thoughts that have been captured on the mail list and um, back to the notes from last week. I think we may have even talked about it some in, in the week before that. Uh, so I wanna open it here to some discussion uh, so that we can get all of our thoughts on the table and then ideally we'll be in a position to vote on uh, Bezu after that. So I, I guess, can I start? Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna help tee it up in case people weren't quite sure where to get <laughs> okay. going, but please. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it rolling and I'll sort of bring back, um, uh, you know, or bring up the, the points that I, I was trying to make and some of the more recent comments um, in the thread. Um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's fine if in fact, you know, Hyperledger is going to uh, have a feel that's more like Apache than, say, uh, Cloud Foundry, right? Um, you know, where there's multiple projects, some are competing or, you know, overlapping in their capabilities and, you know, maybe have different constituencies or what have you um, versus projects and sub projects that are really coordinated and organized around a common framework or something like that. Right. Um, uh, because again, when you think about, okay, so let's just consider from a sort of a, a marketing perspective, if you will, Apache markets Apache and the Apache way. They don't market Hadoop, open whisk, you know, Kafka, rabbit, whatever. That's, you know, th those are, the, the projects are not the thing that's important. The important thing from an Apache perspective that they communicate when, uh, you know, they have their annual conference or uh, at various other venues, they're promoting the Apache way, right? How they help projects incubate, how they help, you know, drive very rigorous uh, IP licensing regime over the, the code base so that the code bases can be trusted, makes it easier for people to consume the open source that comes out of Apache because they can trust that it's not going to be wackadoodle from a, an IP perspective. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that they have, um, you know, a ton of volunteer mentors in the community that work with the projects as they come in and ask, you know, seek to be incubated and, and work through their incubation stages to become active um, uh, such that it scales to, I don't know, it's close to 300 projects, I think, uh, Brian, maybe you know more than I do, but it's, it's about 300 or so projects now. But again, you don't see Jim Jagielski or Sam Ruby or, you know, anybody else running around promoting Kafka, for instance, 
right? That's, uh, uh, I hate to interrupt, that's not quite true. We, we do have the concept of hat sawing. Uh, this is Jim Jagielski speaking, by the way. And so um, for the projects that I am involved with, uh, I uh, do a lot of promotion about those projects. Just uh, but that's, like, again, right, but you just said you're wearing your whatever project hat. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a clear distinction from wearing your hat in your formal role um, on, the, uh, on the Apache board or in the, in the leadership, right? Okay, yeah, I, just, I just wanted to, to clarify the, the confusion that the ASF as an entity does not provide services or promotion to the projects uh, beneath of it. Well, uh, but they do so. The sort of Apache Con conference itself, you'll see that the number of sessions which are specifically about Apache itself, the Apache way, is very, very small um, regarding the actual projects that are being promoted. But I'll let you finish. Yeah, but my, my point though is that, okay, <gasps> again, there's no overarching architecture, you know, technical steering committee, what have you, that says how the projects have to relate to one another or any of that, right? There's, it's- That's definitely true. The, the whole function of the ASF is to provide a safe place to collaborate and build communities around projects. That's it, right? I mean, you know, at one point, you know, it was Brian and a few of his colleagues building, you know, the HTTP server, but it's grown into all kinds of stuff, areas that had nothing to do with the original purpose of the ASF in terms of what projects it was hosting. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, many of the projects have sort of competing marketing endeavors to sort of, oh, you know, Cassandra's better than Spark or whatever, you know. Um, and, and that's fine, right? But Jim, you don't have to run around and choose sides, right? You know, or, or try and make, you know, sort of arguments about what you should use, you know, should you use Spark in this circumstance or Cassandra or, Hadoop or whatever in some other circumstance, you're neutral on that point, unless of course it's a project that you're working on, in which case you're speaking on behalf of the project. I guess that's my point, right? I mean, we have a lot of the messaging that comes, you know, Brian, you know, when you go and talk and you present here are the collection of projects that we have, but then there's this sort of inherent need to try and rationalize them against one another when in fact it's just a collection right, if that's the case. Um, you know, they may be organized around a common sort of a theme of blockchain, but boy, I tell you, I, 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 it, it just, I don't know how you get to the point of trying to do the reconciliation of saying, without necessarily getting, uh, you know, into a sticky sort of situation about recommending what people should do, and yet I think they come to expect, well, Hyperledger should be sort of telling us what to do. This is, this is the, the problem that I have. I, again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fine if that's what we want to be, but if we are going to be like that, then we have to provide a means where Besu can sort of market itself and fabric and sawtooth and what have you. And, and yeah, there may be projects that are designed and intended to be, you know, like Ursa and Transact and TCF and so forth that could be used in multiple contexts. Um, but, the, you know, what do we do with the top level ones? Hey, hey Chris, this is Brian, since, um, I, I, since you call me out specifically on this. I'll, uh, I'll just I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not calling you out. I'm just making that <laughs> observation. It's, it's a challenge for sure. I, I don't want to minimize that. And um, it's a challenge that can only be really met um, uh, by uh, working with everybody on the different projects to describe, um, to be able to articulate the unique advantages of the different projects. And um, the more that they directly overlap, uh, obviously that's, that, that's hard, right? Uh, um, and, and ironically, the more we work towards convergence, <laughs> the, the less those differences may, may be, right? Um, uh, but, but we're right. up for it. Um, I think, you know, we, I think we went down a path pretty early on that was a middle ground between 
you know, Apache, you know, having, having a, a really expansive permit, uh, anybody can come in, um, or, or any of the kind of single architecture kinds of projects out there, including the Linux kernel, arguably, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but this is not out of trend with where, um, you know, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation goes, or, or um, you know, some of, the, some of the newer projects, CDF, uh, the um, Continuous Delivery Foundation, those sorts of other examples I gave. And I think um, we're not alone in trying to figure out the answers to these questions, um, but that this uh, picture of a portfolio organized um, uh, community like Hyperledger is, is becoming more the norm. Um, and we're, we're certainly eager to learn from others uh, on how we can be both champions of the broad as well as champions of the specific. Um, and anyone who's heard me talk has probably heard me go into, you know, advantages of many of the specific uh, platforms, including Fabric. And I don't plan to let up the gas on that. Um, so I think, I think uh, let me just wrap up with convergence is, is a process. It's not an end state. Um, and I, I, I feel like as long as everybody is committed to um, other projects coming in are committed, both that they are distinct in what they offer, um, like they are actually offering something new and genuinely committed to participating in convergence related processes, no matter what the end state ends up being, um, then, then I, that's, that's all we need to be able to go out and, and be a champion uh, uh, for each of these projects. And I think, I think to be able to pull together as a technical community, as a portfolio. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I think there were some other viewpoints that were being discussed on the list more on the, the technical aspect uh, as opposed to marketing. Uh, and so maybe if, if those individuals can speak up at this point, particularly on that architectural convergence front. Looks like Hart and Nate are battling for who can make the longest paragraph on chat. Uh, yeah, and I'll go ahead and, and summarize what I've sort of said is that, um, sure, if we have more projects and, you know, more things going on in Hyperledger, it might increase fragmentation and uh, make it harder to converge within Hyperledger. But it's naive to think that if we don't include projects that they're just going to go away. Uh, they're still going to compete uh, for contributors, for users, for everything else with us outside of Hyperledger, potentially in a much less friendly way. And we will drive more convergence in the space as a whole, uh, I think, if we accept worthwhile projects. And that, that's just my opinion in a, a very brief summary. And my paragraph reflects some of that same sentiment that we're really trying to get the best folks at the table to collaborate on ideas because it's not just about what projects we have in the, the greenhouse today. It's about getting the right people to talk about things so that we get the right projects in the greenhouse for tomorrow. And you know, my hope with Bezu is that we get a lot of <clears throat> quality contributors that will help think about things differently and, and help us move forward in the convergence efforts that we've been working on. Yeah, and I, I want to follow up with, with that, uh, with an observation that today, and I said this before, blockchain technology is in its infancy. Uh, we need we need more innovation. We need more creativity in this space, um, and and you know because of that, you know, competition is good. You know I I I borrow a quote from uh, the Godfather. You know keep your partners close, but keep your competitors closer. Um, so so today we see well you know we bring in another competitive framework, uh, but but you know it is it's it, it's good for us. You know competition drives us better. You know, competition help us, or, or, or at least, you know, it, it forces us to do better. Um, so, so because of that, in my mind, and, and I, I, on the other hand, I also believe in, in the people, right? You know, packages brought in, I heard 26 developers uh, or so. So there's a lot of people here. And I believe that they will contribute in other common projects, like OSA, like Transact. Like the projects that we talked about and, and voted today, um, so to me, it is a, a number game. A, a bigger community is likely uh, to be a stronger community. Um, so you know, regardless of the uh, the technical inno innovation that they have today, even though I, I feel like you know uh, not a whole lot of that coming into Pantheon framework uh, that we have evaluated, uh, but the people behind that. 
uh, would really enrich our community. Uh, and because of that, you know, I, uh, I, I'm in favor of having more competitors rather than less. All right, thanks for that, uh, Ben. Uh, Mark's got his virtual hand up. Yeah, um, so I guess I think it's great that we're having this discussion. And I guess a question for Brian and, and Dan, um, since Dan's our representative on the board, is how much of this is really a technical steering committee decision and how much of this goes back and it's a board decision as it impacts the direction of Hyperledger itself? Well, I think our precedence up to this point is that we uh, that we accept a variety of overlapping projects with an ever raising bar on on what on what uh, differentiation means for those. Um, it would be nice if the board could have weighed in on the the long term picture that they would like to see as far as expansion versus convergence. Um, that's certainly something that I think I would still appreciate hearing from the board, but I think we'll need to resolve this immediate question before the board next meets on the 16th and probably would not be able to, to give us feedback, I'm guessing, for yet another meeting after that. And, and I won't speak for the board, but um... Uh, I mean, Mark, you've been on those calls as well as you're a representative of the general members to it. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I think I think they they want to be supportive of all the convergence efforts and want to figure out how. Um, and we're trying to work to prepare for them options um, for the next budget cycle on how to, um, or, or if we want to, you know, specifically resource certain convergence efforts and what that might mean. You know, how do we just help the community move further along on that? Um, but I, I do think they expect us to figure out this kind of meta roadmap uh, kind of story um, in the technical communities. I think they, they believe there's strength in that. Um, obviously, they're concerned about whether we get uh, overloaded from a resource and staffing and, and marketing point of view as well. But, um, you know, a pretty, uh, and just for the sake of everyone else, a pretty regular part of the board meetings is a pipeline, uh, a sense of, you know, a report to the board of, you know, here's the projects coming down the pipe. Um, uh, that we know of, you know, sometimes we don't know of them. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, every board meeting we have a conversation about kind of what that pipeline looks like. Um, uh, and, you know, there hasn't been any pressure to say no on the basis of lack of resources. Um, I, I, but, uh, um, yeah, again, I don't, I won't, I don't want to speak for the board on that front, but I, I have not heard anything negative about the principle of trying to attempt both <laughs> expansion and convergence simultaneously. Yeah, thanks. I just wasn't sure how much board business I could discuss on the call. So I, uh, this is Arno. I have to say I totally agree with Nage uh, on the point that you cannot force those things. I mean, this is open source. People will do what they are interested in. And, you know, the TSE for sure has been very supportive of collaboration across all the projects from the beginning, right? And I don't think that has changed. And, you know, we have now seen a few projects started, and I think everybody welcomes that. But it's not like we can sit there and say, hey, you need to collaborate with this guy and converge on so and so. What I do find a, a, an interesting question is, you know, we keep coming and Vipin keeps bringing up the role of the working groups. And, and Mika said before, you know, the working groups have no teeth. And it seems to me that, you know, there's actually a link to what might, you know, the role that EEA might play in some way there is, you know, if we were to define some standard modules that could be used by different frameworks, for instance, should we have some kind of specification that says this is the standard API for this or the standard protocol, whatever the case might be, and, you know, who is in charge of doing this? Unless we had a charter where people say, hey, this is where we're going to define these things, and if you care, you should participate. I think the working group will still suffer from lack of you know, recognition and support. Yeah, and I think we discussed some of that last week, Arno, as well. And um, yep. 
the, it, you know, it would seem, you know, maybe we don't call it a working group, but we discussed how while everybody has their own language, uh, programming language, and there's no clear APIs for a lot of things, and it's sort of when you pull something out of Project X to make it a separate project that can be reused, I haven't necessarily seen, and maybe I've just missed it, but you don't really, you know, you define what the API is so it fits back into your project. You don't really work with the other projects up front to come and say, okay, you know, what's the best API to get reuse here? And I had asked, the, you know, well, could the architecture working group be used for something like that? And the answer was, that's not really what they do. But I think, you know, if we want to do a lot of reuse and convergence, it would be great to have some type of team to go off and, you know, maybe try to figure out common APIs and things like that and, and how to use things and people migrate to that over time. Okay. And I, think and I have to say, I mean, we're, we're I mean, this very, you know, I spend a lot of my time working on standards and the way those things happen is not by force, right? It's people get together and say, hey, we all have that same problem. Can we all, you know, come up with a common solution that we can all then support and, and remove a pain point for everybody? And so to me, again, this is this notion, you have to make it possible, but you cannot force it. In this case, we would have to have some kind of charter for a working group to say, hey, this working group is going to define how to do this or how to interface, right? This kind of component, what what is expected of the component, what kind of behavior and, and so on. And then, you know, if there is enough people who feel like, yeah, this is valuable, then we would have a support and people would engage and create this and then support them in their framework. And then there would be a win for everybody. But we don't really have that mechanism today. And I don't think the kind of working groups we have today have this kind of support. Okay, and with that, we're down to the last five minutes here. Um, for me, what I've been thinking is that Bezu or Pantheon would be successful with or without Hyperledger. I think it's got enough backing behind it. So the question for me is really, would Hyperledger be more successful with, with Bezu with another stack? And I think what I, what I hear that's persuasive to me in this discussion is that we're more likely to have the kinds of collaborative discussions with that community if Bezu is a part of the Hyperledger greenhouse or open rangeland, as Nate is uh, alluding to there. Um, but I think either way, uh, we owe that project a vote. And so I move that we take up a vote now on Bezu. Would anybody like to second that? I second that. Okay, um, Arnaud? Yes. Bow Wow. Yes. Ben. Yes. Chris. Oops, Chris? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Dan. Can I pause longer for more drama than, than Chris provided? Yes. Hart. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Mark. Yes. Mick. Yes. Nate. Yes. Silas. Yep. It passes uh, unanimously. Fantastic. Um, so that went quickly enough. We have maybe a, a couple minutes. Uh, Mick wanted to give a quick update, and then I would like uh, one or two minutes at the end for something. Yeah, I'll make sure that this is really quick. Um, so I know I've been, so there have been a number of discussions about Okay, not sure who that was. Um, there have been a number of discussions about kind of futures of working groups. Um, some have been on the mailing list. We've been trying to capture all of the notes um, on the working group task force page. Um, we've got at least a start at a couple of the proposals. Just wanted to invite in particular um, kind of the working group leads to go in and take a look at that um, uh, and make sure we get some feedback on it. Uh, so um, I think. At a minimum, the convergence that we're having right now is that the working groups have to be much more finely grained in their scope. Um, 
uh, focus much more on specific tasks or problems rather than general areas. Um, and then the question becomes, can we take the other role of working groups, which has been to foster discussion and either leave that as the role of the working group or move it over to, um, to more sig structure. So that's essentially where the discussion is going at this point. Um, please weigh in on the ideas that we have out there. Okay, thanks. And I moved on so quickly, I don't think I gave a uh, congratulations to the Bezu team. So congrats for that. Uh, and uh, so as we close up this meeting, this is the last meeting of this technical steering committee. Uh, as the vote concludes next week, a newly elected, elected group will take over here. Maybe we'll have some of the same faces, maybe some different ones. But I would like to uh, at least personally thank everybody who has served on this technical steering committee. Uh, I think over the, the year or years that uh, we've been working together on this, we've found good ways to collaborate, uh, especially where some of us have started in uh, maybe more adversarial competitive positions, we've arrived at more collaborative competitive positions. And I think that's to the betterment of the whole community. So. Uh, thanks to each of you for the extra time in your day that uh, this committee has consumed for you. And thank you, Dan, for being such a capable chair. Thanks, all. Thanks, thanks everyone's effort. All right, and with that, we will uh, draw this meeting to a close. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>